All right, so I think we're going to get started. Um, so thanks to everyone for coming back and joining us again. Um, so this is session two, um, and um, this might go a little strange. Okay, um, so just a few quick logistical things to talk about. Um, so if you're joining us remotely, um, we have just so everyone's aware, we've muted your incoming audio in order to reduce background noise. Um, so if you have questions, please use your chat window and we will be monitoring that actively this session. So unlike last session. <laughs> um, so we should be able to get to your questions. Um, we will also take any questions offline via email or Twitter. Um, and of course, all these slides are gonna be posted so you have our contact information. Okay. So just to quickly recap, um, so we've worked our way through sort of the first part of our lesion symptom mapping pipeline. So we've talked about scanning and lesion drawing. Um, and where we are now is sort of at the point where we actually want to run an analysis. Um, and then we're going to talk about what do you do with the, um, the output of that analysis. Um, and um, last time we also talked a little bit about voxel-based lesion symptom mapping or VLSM which is the technique that was used for quite a while until about 2014 or so. Um, and that was sort of the standard. Um, and now what we're going to be switching to is we're going to be talking about multivariate lesion symptom mapping. And um, I believe we will, when we start talking about the, that in our first talk, we will sort of explain the reasoning behind switching. Um, and also, um, <clears throat> For those of you who are interested, um, there are a couple of software packages that are available. We're going to be primarily talking about the first one, um, which is the MATLAB package. But there is a similar package also available in R. Um, and then again, just a brief reminder, um, we will be primarily using MRICON to show a lot of um, our lesion maps. And all of the materials for today's workshop are available on our website. All right, so with that, I will hand it over to Harrison. All right, um, so before we jump uh, straight into the multivariate uh, lesion symptom mappings, I first want to just briefly uh, review what we talked about last time with BLSM and then talk and then discuss um, some of the problems with this approach and why a multivariate approach is warranted. Um, so. Uh, just generally, what you're doing is you're comparing the behavioral scores of those with lesions and those without, and then you're computing some kind of test statistics. So what we talked about last time was getting a, doing a t-test, but you could also do things like chi-square or regression-based analysis as well um, to derive ultimately a p-value to determine significance. <clears throat> However, um, there's been some major limitations to this approach that have been discussed in the uh, field for the last couple of years. Um, for example, uh, you're assuming each voxel is independent of one another because you're running a t-test in one vo in e at a voxel level. However, we know to things know for things like through the vasculature that lesions are um, non-randomly distributed, so that's not a safe assumption to make. You're also running thousands of tests and increasing the potential for false positives. Um, as we talked about last time, there are some ways that you can correct from this or correct this, but so by doing so, you might be removing some of the true signal because these correction techniques are pretty conservative. And then finally, um, different voxels have different lesion to no lesion ratios. So if you remember from last time, we talked about that you have to set a threshold for how many lesion voxels there must be for you to even consider it in the analysis. Um, but you could get some instances where you have, let's say, four lesion vox four people without a lesion in say 10 with a lesion, and that's going to bias the results of your statistical analysis um, because of this unbiased ratio. Um, so due to these limitations, um, the field has kind of suggested alternatives to uh, analyzing the relationship between lesion location and behavior. Um, and one of those is with a multivariate technique, where instead of just considering one voxel and running a statistical analysis, we're now considering multiple voxels to help uh, determine that relationship with behavior. <clears throat> now, this has an, a number of obvious benefits. Uh, one is reducing the number of tests, because if all your voxels are in one model, then now you're not running hundreds of thousands of tests anymore. Um, you can also start to do things like consider the relationship between voxels when computing significance. And you also don't have to worry about the uneven distribution as much. <clears throat> 
So there are two um, widely used approaches, I would say. Um, the first is support vector regression, or the SVR. Um, that's what we're going to be focusing on today. Um, another approach that is commonly discussed in the field is sparse canonical correlation analysis for neuroimaging, or SCAN. I think we're going to briefly talk about that a little uh, next week, but in both Aaron Wong's lab and Laurel Buxbaum's lab, we've focused with the, uh, the SVR approach. So this is a, um, a figure from Zhang et al. 2014, where they first uh, introduced the SVR. So if you can see, there's something else. Well, I'll just point. So uh, this top, this is with synthetic lesion data. Um, so these blue boxes are where the relationship between lesion and behavior is supposed to be. Um, as you can see in the top box is the VLSM, and then the bottom is the SVR. Um, so if you look here, um, the VLC, VLSM is actually missing where the synthetic data said there should be a relationship, but with the SVR, they're capturing it. And Zhang also goes through this uh, similar exercise with actual data, not just uh, simulated data as well, and shows that the SVR captures some of these smaller, more difficult to detect clusters, whereas the VLSM misses them. Okay, so uh, a conceptual overview. Um, the way I'm going to kind of walk through this is first I'll go through some parts of what you're doing conceptually with an SVR, and then I'm going to show you guys what the actual interface looks like when you're running it and kind of walk through uh, what those look like when you're executing it. <clears throat> so um, what you're doing in a real layman uh, way of looking at it is you're just a regression equation where you're just taking all of your voxels and you're inputting those as the independent variable and then your behavior is the dependent variable, and your output is simply just a beta value for each voxel. So the strength of the relationship between that voxel and predicting behavior. Now, this model is really complicated for a number of reasons. Uh, one is because of the high collinear collinearity between neighboring voxels. So as I mentioned before, there's a non-random distribution of where lesion voxels take place. So this means you have some relationship between those that are correlated and um, you need to account for that when you're making your regression model. Another is that you have a high number of IVDs relative to DVs, and this can create an unstable model. So what we need to do is use a machine learning approach to help us um, deal with these uh, factors. So the way the machine learning approach deals with this is it uh, constrains the model with hyperparameters, um, and thus one of the implications of this is that it transforms it to a nonlinear space. The real critical point, though, that you should take from this is that our beta values that we get from this are not statistically interpretable, and I'll show you some graphs that hopefully will demonstrate why to you in a little bit. Um, one other step that we should consider, too, is a model validation. So even though we've run our regression, we want to make sure that the beta values and the outcome of it is actually fit for our data, and we didn't have perhaps some outliers or something that's throwing it off. So the way we do that in the uh, SVR is with a k-fold cross-validation, and I'm just going to walk through what that is briefly if you're not familiar with it. So if we have our sample of, let's say, 30 subjects, the first thing we break that up into is an, an equal number of um, smaller groups, and then we take two of those groups, the ones in green, and we make them our test set, and then we take the remaining four groups and we train our data with that and then compare those results on the test set to see how valid our model is. And then you do that a number of times, depending on how many folds you want to run. So this would be an instance of a three-fold analysis. As you can see, each group is both a training group and a test group. So you're randomly moving, or not randomly, but you're systematically moving that across. So you get a, making sure you're looking at every group individually. And then finally, you record the model parameters. And then the average from all those are uh, what you actually use in your actual model. Um, so this is something that's been added recently to it, so it's, it's nice for us to look at. Okay, so this is what the interface looks like of the SVR uh, GUI program. Um, it's all done through MATLAB, as Aaron mentioned before, and I'm going to pull that up once I walk through uh, my portion of the talk to also show you guys what some of the drop-downs and file options you can see are. But just to give you a basic overview, um, so the first part that we're going to fill out is just setting up our actual regression analysis. Um, so that all takes place in this box right here. So just some basic things such as specifying your analysis name, um, selecting the output folder you want, also the lesion folder. So unlike with the VLSM, it's actually this GUI is pretty particular in that it wants all its files to be .nii files, so you'll need to make sure that they're formatted that way. 
And then also finally the score file, and this has to be a .csv file. Um, and it also needs to be formatted um, in such a way that the first column is the MR numbers, and they need to match exactly how they're listed um, in the actual Legion file names, minus the extension, so you don't want to include the .nii in there. And then um, the rest of the column should just be your behavioral scores. Um, and you can see down here at the bottom that you can then, there's a drop down that will read all of the column headers and you can pick which behavioral score you want. And then finally, um, this little section right here is also nice as a sanity check to make sure that all of the MR numbers or participant numbers in your CSV file are matched in your actual uh, folder that contains lesion files. So if those numbers don't match or it's less than you'd expect, you have a nice way of confirming that it's not reading all of them. <clears throat> Okay, so just like with the VLSM, there's a couple of factors that you're going to want to consider before just running your analysis. Um, the first is, we're interested, are you interested in high or low values? So uh, you'll need to set up the SVR so it's reading things in the appropriate direction. Finally, you're going to, or in addition, you're going to want to control for total lesion volume. So as I mentioned last time, there's a couple of different ways you can do this. Um, the first is DTLVC, which stands for Direct Total Lesion Volume Control. And what you're doing there is you're just trying to minimize the effect of larger total lesion volumes by taking the value of the voxel and then putting, dividing that by the square root of total lesion volume. Now, one problem with this approach is that if there's no lesion in the voxel, the voxel is not lesion, the value is zero, which means you're not really controlling for the total lesion volume across the entire brain, but only those um, in only those voxels that are lesioned. So another approach is that you could regress on lesion. Um, so all you're doing there is you're regressing the total lesion volume out of the voxels and then using those residuals in your actual model. Finally, you could also do a regress on behavior where you're regressing the total lesion volume out of behavior and using those residuals. So if you were concerned just that people who had bigger lesions might have lower behavioral scores and you wanted to control for that, this would be a nice way of doing that. And then finally, you could do regress on both where you're doing uh, regress on lesion and behavior at the same time, and then using both of those separate residuals in your actual model. Um, all of these approaches, at least from our experience, seem to do different things with your data. That's not something we're gonna talk about this week, but I think we're gonna kind of touch on that next week and just our experiences with what these are doing and, and how they might give you slightly different results. Um, you also need to consider your lesion threshold value, just like you would with a, a SVR or VLSM, sorry. Um, so as before, we typically use 10% or three, whichever of those numbers is higher. And then if you had any other covariates of interest that you might want to regress out of your behavioral score, you can also, um, the model can accommodate that as well. So now we're going to be looking at these two boxes in the GUI. Um, so first is the hypothesis direction. So um, in this dropdown, it says high scores are good or high scores are bad. So that's fairly intuitive and so far that if you're interested in, say, accuracy, um, you would want to select high scores are good because it's going to show you the lesion associated with the bad scores. Whereas if you were interested in, say, RT and you wanted higher RT values, you would put the high scores are bad. It does get a little complicated if you want, say, the opposite of that. So if you wanted people with lower RTs, um, the, the way it works is it's always going to give you the values that it thinks are, are bad. So if you're telling it that high scores are bad, um, it's going to give you those scores, where if you're telling it high scores are good, it's going to give you the low scores. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, cool. Uh, the total lesion volume correction method you want to choose. Um, so again, this is a drop-down menu where you can choose from the ones that I just listed before. Uh, your lesion threshold, so that's just the number, not a percent. And then finally, the covariates. And this will also pull from your Excel sheet, as you can see down there at the bottom. <clears throat> okay, so now that we have our, we've run our regression equation and we have our beta maps, as I kind of explained before, we need to, to determine significance because these beta values are not um, statistically interpretable. And this is a figure uh, from Dan Merman that I think does a nice job of exemplifying that. Uh, so on the x-axis, we have the beta values from the output, and then on the y is the p-values. And that red area down at the bottom is all the beta values that would be considered significant. But hopefully that you can, you can see the relationship is not uh, linear. So you have some beta values 
for example, that are at a three that have very low p-values, whereas you have some beta values that are at a seven where p-values are much higher. Um, so because of this, it's, it's not something that you can use to statistically determine significance. So another approach that we can use is to determine permutations. So you could choose any number of permutations you want. Um, what seems to be pretty standard is 10,000. Um, but what you're doing is you're going to build up a null distribution by um, reshuffling the behavior and the lesions randomly with one with another pair. Um, and from that, you'll get your null distribution. And then you're going to test at uh, the voxel level again if a given voxel's beta value is significantly different from this null distribution. And from there, that's what's going to derive your p-value. So this, as you might know, creates a problem with many tests again, which we were trying to avoid with the multivariate approach, as we're now looking for our p-values at the voxel level. Um, there are a number of ways to correct for this that Frank's going to go over a little later, but just to bring that to your attention as a potential problem. <clears throat> okay, so this is where we actually run the permutation test in this final part of the GUI. Um, so as you can see, it's, it's pretty straightforward. You're just specifying the number of permutations and then the uh, voxel-wise p-value and the cluster-wise p-value. The cluster is one of the correction techniques that you can use that Frank's going to go over. Um, but yeah, so both of those, you're just going to set a, a p-value. Finally, um, another approach that you could do is the family-wise error correction. Um, so this is an alternative um, that allows you to kind of circumvent the number of tests that you need to run. Um, Frank's going to go over that a little bit, but just so when he mentions that, you have an idea of where that's located on the GUI. Okay. So now I'm going to go and uh, walk through the output folder that you get from the SVR analysis. Well, first, actually, let me open it up so you guys can see what that's all about. <clears throat> Did anyone have any questions, by the way? I know that was kind of dense. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So to open up the GUI, um, and all the computers in the cluster have this, um, so you should be able to run on any one of them. Um, however, these can take quite some time to run. So for example, if we have run analysis with uh, 40 individuals, and if you're doing the cross-validation, it can take about 22 hours just to get one done. Um, and so the computer on the far left, MATLAB 3, is typically the fastest. Whereas if you were to run MATLAB 1 or 2, it could take, I don't know, 40 or 60 hours just to get one done. So just keep that in mind when you're running these, especially if you have a lot of behavioral measures or, um, as I mentioned, there is the some of the variations you get with your results in the total lesion volume control. So if you want to see how different total lesion volumes control affect your results, you might run different iterations even within the same behavior. Um, okay. So to run it, all you need to do is type in the MATLAB command window SVRLSM GUI, and then after a second or two, the box that I showed you all before will pop up. Okay, so just like this. Um, these are just pretty simple, um, open, and then you'll just navigate to a, a folder or file. Um, and then, as I said before, these are all drop downs that specify from the Excel file which column you want to pick. This has your your high scores are good and high scores are bad to determine your your directionality. Um, here we have the different. Oh, oh sure. Um, where's the little? Can you not make it bigger, or am I just? Oh, that didn't do it. <laughs> uh, okay, let's try that again. Um, there's, it's not, it's all grayed out. We have minimize and close. <laughs> oh. Hmm? Oh. Um, nope. <laughs> uh, and just make it well I had those up before if we want to show drop down windows that really doesn't yeah 
Um, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, move that window and click the window behind. Move the this one? Right yeah, well, that's go. just, no, 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 we need the, the GUI, not okay. this. We need this guy to be bigger. And would you like to command plus? Practices? Matlab? In MATLAB? Yeah. All right, hold on one second. So it's just the top menu. You can move the cursor up the top and click the green again. Move it? And now just resize that window. Just drag the corner of the window. Uh, no, yeah. Yeah, I would go to MATLAB. You go to MATLAB yeah. and then preferences. Okay. And then go to font. Uh, okay. You can change the uh, size to okay. keep it as a mono space. Okay, let's try 18. Does it work with the GUI? Um, yeah. Nope. Uh, All right. No. <laughs> Any other suggestion? <laughs> you can edit it in guide, but it has to. Okay. You might be able to change the pixels of the actual screen as well, which is it increases yeah. the size of the just in the background. Like a uh, <laughs> <laughs> Command. Okay, I could try that. No, that didn't. No. Okay, system preferences. Out of all the things I was going to have problem with today, I was not <laughs> expecting it to be this. Uh, okay, yep. Oh, zoom. And then, what, where would you? Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, okay. So, zoom in is... Control command equals. No, that's not right. Oh, maybe. Shift, yeah. Oh, shift, okay. Nope. Well, that the doesn't. Scroll gesture, modifier key, so when you hold control and you scroll. Mm. Okay. Oh, yeah. there we go. Yeah. All right. <laughs> 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 Back. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so this is the GUI. Um, and so, yeah, most of it's just consisted of drop down menus that make it super easy to pick what you want. Um, for things like the K fold cross validation, that's actually under method. By default, it is turned off, but I think, at least for our purposes in MATLAB 3, they've all been turned on because we've used them for various analyses. Um, and then also, I should have mentioned this before, but the number of folds you pick can all, determines like how many subgroups you get. So if you have a smaller sample size, you probably want less folds because if you pick more folds, then your folds just going to consist of one group. So if that group has some outliers, it's going to throw everything off. Um, so we've typically stuck with just the default of five. Um, and then uh, things like hyperparameters, again, we just leave these all at the default. These all come from Zhang's paper and what he recommends. Um, and then the implementation, if you actually want to run the SVR um, commands with either MATLAB or the lib SVM function. I don't think there's actually a difference between the two. It's just if you have the SVM package. But I don't, I don't think you can do cost validation. Under oh, yes, that's right. So that is one, one change. Um, so, yeah, that's it. It's pretty simple. Um, you can also then save whatever your... Um, preferences and selections here as a .mat file. And then if you make three or four of them, you can run them in a batch job and then just let it go like overnight or over the weekend and hopefully get your maps done that way. <clears throat> okay. So that's that. And now I'll just gonna, uh, I'll open up the, the output folder so you can see where all these various maps are that I've mentioned and, and which ones that we typically look at and I think Frank's going to go over the actual results and how to interpret them and things of that nature. Yep.
I guess I should let it wait. So this is all stuff that you guys should have, or at least it was available on the website, so if you wanted to download it, um, you can. Um, but the output folder is actually set up in a way similar to how I kind of just walk through things. Um, so let me just get MRI client open. Uh, so this first folder is going to have your unthresholded beta value maps. Um, so these are the maps that come straight out of the raw regression before you've gotten any kind of correction for um, to determine significance. Um, or what you're actually showing them, right? Yeah. yeah, okay, so I'll just leave that. And then um, afterwards in this folder, the, the voxel-wise, um, these are the maps that um, come out of determining the significance at the voxel level. And then if you did run a cluster correction analysis, that would all be in here. Um, you do get a number of different maps as well, so it also will compute things like an overlap map for you. So if you needed that, um, you could do that as well. Um, it will tell you things like your total lesion volume, and it gives you, as the output from the voxel lies, both the P threshold and Z, but these maps are identical to one another. It's just what test statistic is represented in each voxel. Okay, so I think that's it on my end. Okay, cool. Um, right, so, um, great, so that was just a lot of content. Um, let me just kind of walk through what we just did, right? So we want to go from something like this, where you have um, many people who have lesions drawn, you have a vector of behavior, right? These are the two inputs, uh, the lesions and the behavioral scores. Ultimately, you're gonna get something like this, right? These are some data from a paper we published earlier, um, last year, excuse me. And so what you wanna do is to try to make sense of that. And so what I'm gonna be talking about is post-analysis processing, okay? And so um, it takes a couple different forms. Uh, as Harrison mentioned, we're going to discuss multiple comparison correction and with that, um, you can handle that in numerous ways, internal to the SVR LSM toolbox in MATLAB, um, or with some custom scripts that we have, okay? Um, that touches on cluster size thresholding, our Z maps, okay? And so I'm gonna talk a bit about that um, and the outputs that you get um, from internal to the SVR LSM toolbox that does cluster size thresholding, viewing those results and differences before and after the correction, and then I'm gonna, at the end, um, talk about how we can independently identify those peaks and clusters from those um, that we identify in our post-analysis processing, okay? But first I'm gonna talk about these three topics, okay? Um, so as Harrison mentioned, the output that we get is a, a, these are raw beta values as the first output in the SVR LSM analysis, right? And they're uninterpretable, right? So um, in and of themselves, okay? So you have, and, and you all listening and, and you all here can open up this map. This is the overlap map. And I suggest you do just to get an understanding of the data that go that you get at multiple levels of the analysis. Um, so this is just the space inside which we're gonna be able to do the analysis, okay? Setting the minimum seven and the max to about 30 um, and using the spectrum color, okay? So um, just so you're aware of what, the type of data you get, um, and and knowing what the data are that we're that we're supplying, um, and so this is the space that you're going to do your analysis in. Here are the uh, raw beta values. Okay, so as Harrison mentioned, um, these are uninterpretable. The min is set to zero, the maximum is set to ten. Um, that value, the 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 direction of the data, positive or negative, depend on what you're interested in looking at, right? So if you're looking at ac uh, accuracy, typically you look at negative going uh, values. If you're looking at response time and you want to identify where people are doing worse or slower at identify or doing the task, you might look at positive values. But in and of themselves, there is no p-value associated with this. Okay. So what the output is um, is a beta value, uh, also referred to as a feature weight. Right. So the the degree to which um, lesions to any given voxel predict performance 
in the cognitive task of interest, okay? But inherently, there is no significance here. And as Harrison showed, that scatter plot, we need to be careful and do proper uh, analysis of the degree to which beta values are significant. And to do so, we use um, a forms of permutation testing, okay? So as I mentioned, this is uninterpretable in isolation. Um, the script gives you uh, or performs several iterations of permutation testing. So um, you can, so one, one thing that we typically look at are the voxel level maps. And so the um, second folder here, I'm just going to pull this up just so everyone is aware. Um, the, um, actually, hang on, it's, so SVR, okay. Um, so here, if you're looking, and um, right, so here is that map I just showed you, the unthresholded map here. Sorry, just bear with me for a moment. Okay, um, this is all, it's also going to give you your lesion overlap map here. So this structure is always the same, no matter what analysis you run, it's going to look identical to this. So you can look at your overlap map, um, you can look at your um, raw betas, though they're uninterpretable in and of themselves. In setting up the GUI, you specify how many iterations of the permutation test to run. So we typically do 10,000. What it then gives you are numerous maps. Here is the map that we typically look at. It's the final one in this folder, the Z map. And so now you have your voxels that are going to look identical to this spatial arrangement, yet they're going to be coded based on their Z score. So it's going to, in each voxel, run a permutation analysis where you get a null distribution. So you assign random behavioral data to the lesion data. You run the SVR 10,000 times. So for each voxel now, you have 10,000 values. You get the mean standard deviation. You z-score your true data relative to that mean and standard deviation. And that's what you obtain here, okay? And so to come back to this map, okay? So as I just described, permutation testing allows us to z-score our data. So you go from this to that. Okay, so now here are the same data, gesturing tool use, uh, set to a minimum of 165. So this is a z-score associated with the P that you tell the SVR LSM GUI to use. So 05 is, is one way of going about it. And because, as we mentioned, you specify the direction of your data, whether you're interested in people who do worse, like, so high scores are good. So that means you're going to look at where lesion presence is associated with worse performance in the task. Okay, and so what you'll notice is that there are large clusters, but then you also have some smaller um, voxel little blips on the radar here. And so um, intuitively, you know, you may want to consider doing additional cluster level correction. So at the individual voxel level, these are significant, but the question is, do these form sort of coherent clusters, uh, contiguous clusters of voxels? And so there are several ways to do that, okay? Um, both uh, with custom scripts that we've written and also internal to the SVR LSM toolbox. So I'm gonna talk about some of the custom made scripts we do uh, that we've written. And so what it, what it does is it takes that map I just showed you and it scans through all significant voxels and it identifies contiguous clusters, okay? And the way it identifies those clusters is that you give it a threshold value, K, and it identifies where are there uh, voxel uh, clusters uh, that are larger than K. So usually we use 500, um, but it could you could set it to 1,000, you could set it to 2,000. Um, that really is dependent on um, what, if there's a precedent in the area of, that you're studying, um, if there's a precedent in, do, in using lesion symptom mapping. Um, so 500, we've used that, um, given other uh, groups have used that value as well. The point is, is that it's arbitrary, okay? so. Um, this is just a screenshot of a script that we've written. It takes in your map as input. You give it the K value. It's hard coded at 500, but you can change this. You can set it to 100 or 1,000. And what it's going to give you is that same map as before, 
I, and it's going to remove voxels that don't form clusters of at least 500, okay? Um, so that's fairly intuitive. Um, so one pathway in doing your analysis is to stop here, okay? A second pathway, um, which is a bit more rigorous, is to um, perform some additional clustering. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about that, but I, but I got ahead of myself. Um, you know, so just to go between these two maps, you'll notice that, you know, there, there is, we're largely keeping the same uh, cluster because that's a very large cluster in inferior and uh, parietal areas, as well as in post-central sulcus um, and into the temporal lobe as well. Okay, but if you use other tasks for which there's more sparseness in your data, you can um, go from a map that looks like this. So this is voxel level corrected at 05. This is associated with a per performance in a cognitive control task where people have to identify the central arrow is facing left or right. And in one case, the flanking arrows are incongruent. So people are typically slower to say this is left than they are to say this is left, given that there's a congruency between the flanking arrows, okay? And wh what you're seeing here are the um, voxels where lesion presence significantly predicts lower performance, um, longer response time in incongruent trials relative to congruent, okay? After performing a 500 uh, cluster, 500 voxel cluster removal, you'll see it really only identifies this one cluster in um, post-central and touching on parietal cortex, okay? One important thing to note is to obviously look at your data. So that's just on the cortical uh, surface, but if you look into subcortical areas, there's a very large cluster that is of theoretical relevance. I'm not gonna get into that, but the point is is that um, if you were to just look at this type of a representation, it may only give you a, a fairly small cluster. Um, and um, in doing so, you want to identify, you want to know, does this survive a more rigorous type of cluster correction? Okay, um, the point being is you wanna know your data and look at the sizes of your clusters and um, to segue to the next topic, does this survive a more rigorous type of uh, correction? As we mentioned, um, part of Andrew DeMarco's um, SVR LSM toolbox, which we talked about a few moments ago that Harrison walked through, is cluster level correction, okay? Cluster level size correction. And what this is doing is the same as we talked about in point three, which is to identify clusters of significant voxels. Um, but what it's doing is, like with the permutation testing at the voxel level, every time you do that, you create a new map of random um, voxel level data. It can then, on top of that, ask the rel to get the relative size of these clusters that are driven or due to chance, okay? So what it, do it does is it figures, um, where are we identifying random clusters based on scrambling of the behavioral data to the lesions? And are those clusters equal to or even larger than the size of the true data? The clusters in the true data. Okay, so what you then um, get is essentially finding the size of the largest cluster that's due by chance in permutation. And once again, this provides a null distribution of cluster sizes. So we can compare our real clusters to the distribution of clusters that are significantly due to chance. And so what we want to be able to know is um, are the clusters that we're observing in the true data larger than what would be observed just by scrambling the whole process and rerunning it 10,000 times, okay? And so just to give you an idea from start to finish, we work with this lesion overlap map, something like that, looking at raw beta values. Um, here are the voxel-wise data, so, so um, set to 16P05, Z equals 165. Okay, here's when we remove voxels that don't cluster together at five, or that are, I'm sorry, excuse me, voxels that do not cluster together, that cluster to a greater extent than what would be observed in our permutation analysis, okay? So we can compare setting an arbitrary threshold of 500 in this map up here to the threshold that was determined as due to chance. And you'll see because we have really robust data to begin with, not much changes, um, you'll see one or two smaller clusters um, and voxels that are not included here that are not included here that are part of the original analysis, okay? And so this is something you would typically report in a screenshot in a manuscript um, where you can use MRI cron to take pictures of your um, voxel corrected and cluster corrected map, okay? So is that clear? As long as everyone understands sort of filling in what Harrison talked about, how taking the lesions, taking the behavioral data, 
setting the various parameters at each stage of the analysis and working with the final output. Okay. I just want to, inter <clears throat> me, just want to interject really quickly. Um, so you've heard us say 10,000 permutations quite a lot. And you're probably wondering why you need so many. Um, the easy way to think about it is that because you're doing permutation testing, the smallest p value that you can ever acquire is going to be one over the number of permutations that you run. And so if you run 10,000 permutations, the smallest p value you can have is one over 10,000. Um, and that's of relevance because when you start to do these, um, um, these corrections afterwards, a lot of them are based on the value of your p value. And so because we have so many voxels that we are correcting over, we need small p values. The only way you can get that is with large permutations. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, because we do cross-validation, every single um, permutation is also cross-validated, which means that we're not just running 10,000 permutations, we're running 10,000 times the number of, case, of faults that you want, and you can see that this gets sort of exponentially large, which is why one analysis takes like over a day to finish. Yeah. We're also um, in figuring out the details to be able to utilize some of the computing resources at Penn. Um, that's a larger effort here at MRRI, so it's not just any one lab. Um, the idea there being we can use many cores, many you know computational horsepower that they can offer and, and can cruise through the analysis at a much faster rate. Um, but if we were to do it here, typically 20 to 24 hours is how long an analysis would take. Yeah, Eddie? So why do you need to do the uh, permutation um, <clears throat> yeah, so we talked about this with Andrew, and um, the idea is basically that whatever you do to your original data, you also want to do in your permutation. Otherwise, the permutation is not a good representation of like, your processing pipeline, oh, yeah. essentially. So you're, you're, I don't know if we've ever systematically looked at the difference between, have, yeah, between cross-validation and not cross-validation. Oh, yes, that we have. Oh, we have? Yeah. Okay. The cross-validation is stricter. Okay. Yeah. It's stricter. So yeah. we've looked at maps where we've run, or we've done analysis where we've done with capable cross-validation and without, and typically um, the coverage a significant coverage is smaller when you have the capable cross validation included, not by much, but um, yeah. by a noticeable amount. You know, I think the major disclaimer is that you want to have a large sample. So the idea being um, smaller samples, there may be more outliers. The, 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 the chance of outliers having a greater effect, your overall effect may be greater with smaller end. I feel like I'm, so the purpose of the permutation is to um, determine the distribution which is the P value. Yes. Um, the, the coefficient the math. So why do you need to do that for each fold when we're going oh, to? Yeah, you. It's the other way around. So we we cross validate each permutation that goes into the null distribution. Oh, I see. Uh, so you get an so you get an average you get. Five, like let's say you use five, you get five cross-validated maps, and then you average those maps together, and so you get for each iteration you get one map, right? But you're not averaging p values. You're averaging no, you're averaging the feature weights, and then what you then do is for each voxel you get the mean and standard deviation, from which you can compute your true data, the z-score you can obtain a z-score relative to the true data. So it's the same procedure that you do with the true data. Mean standard deviation? Yeah, of the null distribution. So what you you run is you get feature weights for each vox for each voxel in your lesion map, right? I mean, doesn't the permutation test just uh, disregard disregard the distribution and just look mm -hmm. for the yeah uh, yeah? Down? So you, you, your p values don't rely on the ability to calculate these points, but they do both. 
So they they will give you the z scores or p values. I assume the p values are drawn directly from the node distribution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So the z scores are would imply that you think it's normal, but it's hopefully not derived that way. Right. Yeah. So the maps, the z map and the p map correspond pretty well. Okay. Um, so in the last few moments, I was actually going to go over what I went over last week, hoping that it would be a bit clearer how to take the results of the analysis, independently label our, um, um, take the map and be able to identify where the, the, there are peaks in this map relative to a um, template like a Broadman template or AAL template. Okay. I'm just going to go over this once again. Um, right. So now that we have our maps, um, this script works on any kind of map you give it for your input as the first map here, okay? Um, and the second map um, as well is your template map. It could be Broadman, it could be AAL. In this case, we use both. Um, what it's going to do, as I mentioned last week, is it's going to um, pull out the peak value in each region that is within your Atlas map, okay? For you to report in table format in the manuscript. This, as I mentioned, the script is set up to identify the peak. It doesn't have to be just the peak. It's a flexible script. You can write it to um, perform any kind of analysis that you're interested in performing. And what it's going to do principally is to obtain values in an independent region of interest. And then whatever you want to do with those values is up to you. Okay, so just to walk through it once again, it, once it reads in your atlas map, it identifies all of the unique regions in that atlas map. It then loops through all of those unique regions and it identifies where those regions overlap with um, your stat map, okay? Um, it then, as I mentioned, the script is set to find the, the peak. So it takes all of the significant data within your stat map and it um, organizes them based on strongest to weakest values, right? And what it's gonna do is it's going to find, it's hard coded here just to find the first one because it wants to find the peak. It then converts uh, the voxel indices of where the peak is to MNI coordinate um, space. And um, what you then do is it writes out those XYZ coordinates as well as the size of the region in the template map, how many voxels um, are significant in your stat map that overlap with that region in the template map, the identity of the map, as I mentioned, XYZ, what the peak value is, and um, if there are more than one value, more than one voxels in your um, template map that share the same peak value. Okay, so what this is set up to do now is to imagine you have 10 voxels in a given area that have the same value. It's going to take the center of gravity of all of those coordinates, right? As I mentioned, this is a flexible script. If you want to get out those coordinates for each peak, if that was of relevance for you, um, then you can do that as well. Right now, it's just taking the center of gravity. Okay, so it's just taking the mean of all of the peak areas, peak voxels within a given region, but it gives you the number of voxels in a given region that have the same value, right? That have that have that same peak value. Okay, and then it writes out an Excel file. So just to come full circle, here's the, here's one representation of the map I showed you earlier that's been cluster corrected. And then here's the output of that script, okay? So what it gives you are all of the regions the AA, in AAL space, in the AAL map labeled here, the number of voxels in that map in each region, the number of above threshold or significant voxels that are in this AAL region, okay? Here's the identity of that map, the identity of that region according to AAL. Here is the X, Y, Z coordinate associated with the peak. Um, here's that peak value. And in cases where you have one, this is the peak. In cases where you have more than one, like six or 12 or 46, this is the average of those 46 voxels because they all have the same value. So it's just dependent on you and what your analysis is. Um, you could get those 46 voxel values as well if you don't want to report the mean of them, if you wanted to do some other types of analyses, it's a flexible script. So this is just to be as 
transparent as possible to show you guys what this is doing. Um, and you know, you could work with something like this in, in terms of reporting the values um, in a manuscript, in its in table format for your manuscript. So we just want to make sure it's clear that how to go from working with the original outputs of the SVR script to the final output, a cluster corrected output like this, and how to report those peaks. Okay. Um, and that's all we, we wanted to make sure there was time. Yeah. What's Question? the importance of the peaks? Uh, it's just common for for you to report uh, the peak region. So it's typical when you show a whole brain map to uh, report where the strongest values are. Largely comes from fMRI literature. People are reporting, you know, wh what is the voxel uh, that has the strongest bulb response to a certain condition versus another condition. Um, it's also custom in um, region symptom mapping to do this kind of approach as well to report peaks. Um, so the re so the idea here is to continue on with that process. Um, the important point that we want to emphasize, though, is that coming back to the, the point Harrison made a few moments ago, is that you want to report the z-score. Because the raw beta values from the original map are not interpretable, you don't want to report the raw beta values. You want to have the z-score relative to the null distribution. Right? And so that's important to keep in mind as well. Um, because Harrison showed that scatter plot where there's not a there's not a linear relation between stronger beta values and p values, right? and so you want to keep your the data you want to report are your z values in this case. Is it clear to everyone why beta values are not interpretable? Anyone? But I guess I guess I was thinking about this the previous week and sort of the intuition behind why this is true is a little hard to understand at first glance. Because presume you assume in most most of the times when you run multi vector regression, your beta values make sense because they're the coefficients yeah. and they're all in here. But the problem in this case is that this regression is being done in hyperspace, so you're in a very high dimension, and you have to then transform all of that regression back down into three-dimensional space. And that warping from high-dimensional space into low-dimensional space is nonlinear and unpredictable. And so you end up with beta values in one box while not necessarily having any relationship to a beta value in another box. Right, so the way to sort of think about it intuitively is um, if you think about the projection from um, of a map of the globe, right? So if you have a, a globe which is a sphere and you project onto your standard like Mercator map surface, where you basically wrap a cylinder around your sphere and then project everything out onto the cylinder, the amount of distortion of distance at the equator and at the pole is very different. Right? And that's because you're basically reducing your space from three dimensions into two dimensions, and something has to give. And so you end up warping your space. But now, instead of going from three to two, you're going from like 10,000 or something into three. <laughs> and so a lot of dimensions are giving at the same time, and there's no predictability. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> so presumably, there's some kind of constraint. I mean, I don't know how the um, I guess it's really working in hyperspace, but it seems like the sign is really cool at least, right? Um, the sign, yeah, the sign is meaningful, but the problem is, um, so your your hyperspace is essentially every voxel is a dimension in hyperspace, right? Because that's sort of how your multivariate regression works. Um, and so you can think about sort of the tilt of the plane in your hyperspace, and you can make sure that when you back transform, you preserve that sort of tilt. Mm -hmm. But you can't necessarily prefer preserve the flatness of that plane. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's done. It's done. So coefficients are done found with the internet. 
Um, the coefficients are done using support vector regression. So it's, yeah, it's an iterative machine learning yeah. approach. That also comes back to the cross validation as it is you'll, you'll obtain you typically five cross validated maps vectors whereas the number of rows are equal to the number of voxels um, your feature weights but yeah cool are there any other questions? We have no questions coming in. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, next week we're going to talk a bit more about other methods. So we're going to talk about SCAN. Um, we're going to talk about the this machine learning approach um, with lesion data, but instead of using um, lesion voxels, you can use connectivity values. So I'm going to talk a bit about that work. Um, but it builds on the same approach of using, um, you know, using all of your data as features to train a model to learn the relation between features in the model and behavioral scores. So it's a very flexible approach um, that you can use to study many different data sets and different types of patient data. And so we really want you guys to think about um, applications of this approach to other projects you have moving forward and, and to have a really solid understanding of how to approach this with your own data as well. So thanks again, and we'll see you next week.